Have you ever thought, there's got to be a better and simpler way to learn organizational strategies? 5 Minutes Learning has a global and diverse collection of case studies to help management students click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon to stay updated with our upcoming and interesting case studies. Let's take a trip back in time to the 1970s, when coffee culture in the United States was practically non-existent. People were used to dull, tasteless canned coffee, and nobody cared about the flavor or the origin of the beans. It was just a basic, boring drink served in diners and workplaces. But things were about to change. In 1970, three college friends, Gordon Boker, Jerry Baldwin, and Zev Siegel, decided to venture into the coffee business. They set up a shop selling roasted beans, and their knowledge about coffee came from none other than Alfred Pete, the owner of Pete's Coffee. In 1971, they opened their first shop in Pike's Place, Seattle, with help from Alfred Pete, who provided them with beans and reliable bean providers. And that's how the name Starbucks came to be. It's easy to say, impossible to misspell, and has a cool British vibe to it. They were initially going for the name Cargo House Coffee, but fate had other plans. Initially, Starbucks was just a roasted bean retail shop for home use, and they were competing against instant coffee cans. The quality of their beans set them apart, and their business started to thrive. But everything changed in 1982 when they hired Howard Schultz as the head of marketing and sales. Howard Schultz had a vision to create a company that treated its employees with dignity and fairness. He was raised in poverty, and after seeing his father suffer due to manual labor, he was determined to change the injustice faced by the working class. After traveling to Milan, Italy, Schultz had an epiphany about coffee culture. In certain European countries, coffee was an essential part of life, serving as a social lubricant and a place to connect with others. He wanted to bring this coffee culture back to the U.S. The founders were initially hesitant, but Schultz's determination paid off, and they gave him the opportunity to open an espresso bar inside a store. It was a hit, but the owners didn't want to turn the retail business into a cafe. Undeterred, Schultz left Starbucks and opened his own cafe chain called Il Giornale in 1985. He offered to buy all six existing Starbucks stores, and with venture capital, he succeeded and became the CEO after the acquisition. And that's when the hypergrowth of Starbucks began. With Howard Schultz at the helm, Starbucks transformed into the coffee giant we know today, with a focus on high-quality espresso and creating a relaxed coffee culture for people to enjoy. So, the next time you sip on your favorite Starbucks coffee, remember the humble beginnings and the determination that led to its success. You don't want to miss this. So, sit back, relax, and let's dive into the world of coffee. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell, so you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Let's get started. In a world where business success often seems at odds, with taking care of employees and being eco-conscious, Starbucks dared to dream of a different reality. Howard Schultz, the mastermind behind the Starbucks empire, envisioned a company that would prioritize both customers and employees equally. Creating such a harmonious balance seemed like an impossible task, as shareholders typically push for higher profits achieved by cutting costs and keeping wages low. But Schultz had a different vision. He referred to his employees as partners, not just workers, and ensured they were fairly compensated with wages ranging from $10 to $15 per hour along with health care insurance and discounted stock options for company shares. But Howard didn't stop there. He took it a step further and offered full tuition coverage through Arizona State University's online degree program for Starbucks employees. Now that's what you call investing in your people. At first glance, this idea might have seemed outrageous to some shareholders. Giving away a piece of the company's pie to every employee? But Howard understood the value of humane management, 
a lesson he learned from the legendary management guru Peter Drucker. According to Drucker, management isn't just about efficiency. It's also about being more humane and compassionate towards your workforce. It's like the yin and yang of Jordan Peterson's theory of order and chaos. On one side, you have the pursuit of profit, represented by cutting costs and maximizing revenue. On the other side, you have the conscience of doing right by your people, which brings satisfaction and peace to the workplace. And for a customer-facing business like Starbucks, a happy workplace means happy clients. Treating employees well is not just a feel-good strategy, it's a smart business move. In the service industry, customer satisfaction and the way employees treat customers are paramount. And when your employees are happy and well taken care of, they're more likely to treat customers with the same care and respect. So, Starbucks embarked on a mission to create an eco-conscious and employee-friendly environment, defying the norms of the business world. And guess what? It worked. Starbucks not only became profitable but also earned a reputation for being socially responsible and a great place to work. In a world where big corporations are often criticized for prioritizing profits over people and the planet, Starbucks stands out as a shining example of how a company can achieve success while also being kind to its employees and the environment. It's a triple balancing act that makes Starbucks a beloved brand, both by its customers and its partners. And that's why the Starbucks story is not just about coffee, it's about striking the perfect balance and making the world a better place, one cup at a time. If you're a coffee lover, you know there's nothing quite like that perfect cup of java in the morning or throughout the day. And back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, when Starbucks first opened its doors, their espressos and lattes were a game-changer compared to the mediocre coffee options available. Coffee roasting has three main styles, light, medium, and dark roast, each offering different flavors and characteristics. Light roast is fruity and acidic, medium roast is sweet and balanced, and dark roast is bold and bitter. Starbucks predominantly uses dark roast coffee, which is also the most consumed type in North America. While it may not match up to artisan roasters in quality, it was a huge leap from the instant coffee abominations of the early 1980s. But why dark roast? Well, it's cheaper to produce in mass quantities, making it ideal for supplying thousands of Starbucks locations. Plus, maintaining consistency is crucial for a global brand, and a dark roast ensures the flavors remain uniform across all cafes. Beyond the coffee itself, Starbucks nailed the branding game. Their iconic green siren logo graces slim and elegant takeaway cups that differentiate them from the mundane styrofoam cups you find elsewhere. It's a silent word-of-mouth strategy, making Starbucks drinkers stand out and feel part of a sophisticated, culturally progressive coffee drinking culture. Just like Apple did with iPods and white earbuds, Starbucks created a status symbol through its cups attracting trend followers who wanted to be a part of the experience. The green siren made a statement, and everyone wanted in on the trend. As the company expanded, so did their offerings. Starbucks went beyond dark roasts and espressos to introduce the horizontal offer concept, catering to a broader audience. They added sweet treats, breakfast sandwiches, and later, gluten-free and protein-rich options to keep up with health and fitness trends. And with this expansion, Starbucks inadvertently created a market for premium roasted bean roasters, sparking a niche movement for coffee connoisseurs. But with better coffee and a premium brand comes a higher price. Starbucks drinks aren't the cheapest in town but they've maintained a loyal customer base by providing a premium experience and differentiating themselves from fast food coffee chains. Despite the higher prices, Starbucks enjoys a gross margin of around 85%, giving them the financial leverage to invest in brand equity and keep raising the bar. The Starbucks experience isn't just about the beverages, it's also about the merchandise. 
Their holiday-themed mugs and localized artwork add to the brand's exposure, enticing customers to buy more than just a cup of coffee. They diversified their products, added non-caffeinated beverages, and ventured into the retail space with tea offerings after acquiring Tazo and Tivana. So, when you walk into a Starbucks, you're not just getting a cup of coffee, you're getting an experience. It's the perfect blend of better coffee, product differentiation, and a brand image that attracts coffee enthusiasts and everyday customers alike. Starbucks may not be your typical corner coffee shop, but it's become an iconic symbol of the coffee culture, one cup at a time. To understand why Starbucks has become a global coffee powerhouse, we need to dive into the key elements of its success flywheel. This flywheel, as described by Jim Collins in Good to Great, comprises several interconnected components that create a powerful cycle of growth and excellence. At the heart of Starbucks' success is its Level 5 leadership, embodied by its CEO, Howard Schultz. Level 5 leaders possess a unique blend of personal humility and unwavering determination. Schultz's ambition is not just for himself but for the organization and its purpose, which is to inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person, one cup, and one neighborhood at a time. Starbucks faced tough times in the past, but instead of turning away from challenges, Schultz confronted the reality head-on. He made bold decisions, such as closing stores for retraining and investing in customer-facing initiatives to get the company back on track. The hedgehog concept emphasizes three critical elements. Elite skill, deep passion, and the ability to generate revenue. Schultz's shrewdness, combined with his deep love for the company and its people, propelled Starbucks forward. The core of any successful company lies in its people. Starbucks places greater importance on character attributes over specific educational backgrounds or work experience when selecting its employees. Schultz fostered a culture of discipline that prioritizes delivering exceptional customer service. Baristas are trained to use the latte system, listen, acknowledge, take action, thank, and explain, to handle difficult situations, ensuring the Starbucks experience remains top-notch. For Starbucks, technology plays a crucial role in its global expansion. However, the key is to carefully select the right technology and integrate it into the core hedgehog concept, not the other way around. Starbucks leveraged data analytics to know its customers better and used technology to enhance customer experience, from gift cards and mobile payments to the Starbucks Rewards program. Starbucks didn't rush into adopting new technology. Instead, they gradually introduced it, adhering to the hedgehog concept. From gift cards and mobile payments to advanced big data analytics, Starbucks embraced technology strategically to maximize customer relationships. The Starbucks flywheel is a powerful force that keeps the company moving forward. From disciplined leadership to a deep understanding of customer needs and the integration of technology, Starbucks has become more than just a coffee chain. It's a global coffee experience that inspires and connects people, one cup at a time. Thank you so much for listening to this video. Do not forget to subscribe this YouTube channel for receiving updates about my upcoming case study videos.